Hello and welcome to the channel. I'm Jenny and if you're new here, I've been doing the carnivore diet since December of 2022 and I've been chronicling my results with weight, measurements, DEXA scans, and continuous glucose monitoring. But I wanted to go a little deeper. Between month six and seven, I got some extensive blood work done. So today I'm going to share those results with you along with some interpretations. I've been chronicling my carnivore diet experiment. So I have full 30, 90 and 200 day updates that I'm going to put in a playlist at the end of this video and I'll link them in the description below. Before we get started, I have to mention that I am not a doctor and you should always consult with a physician before you make any major changes with your health. Please do not take any of this as personal medical advice. So a little background, in February of 2020, I started following a traditional calories in, calories out method of eating and using the Noom app to lose weight after my twin pregnancy. And I was having very, very slow weight loss progression. I had lost 22 pounds in 11 months. I was understandably frustrated. Now, my husband had been badgering me to try the carnivore diet. He really wanted to try it, but he wanted me to do it with him. So I finally bit the bullet. I did a bunch of research and I decided to try it out for 30 days. So in December of 2022, I started the carnivore diet and I have been on it ever since. As of recording, it's the end of July, 2023. Now I was really interested in what would happen to my blood work after at least six months on the carnivore diet. So while I was waiting to get to that point, I did a bunch of research on blood work, uh, specifically pertaining to blood work while on a high fat, low carb diet. And I found a bunch of excellent resources. I've linked them all below along with some books, articles, journal articles, case studies, and other resources on cholesterol and the carnivore diet in general. We low carb people have slightly different blood work than the general population, and that can be concerning for some physicians, but we are going to talk about all of that today. So here's what I had tested, several standard lipid panels, several advanced lipid panels or lipid particle size tests, lots of blood sugar related tests, inflammation markers, and we tested for vitamins and minerals. So first, what's the goal with blood work. Generally, we get blood work to get a snapshot of our health. So my goal is to be metabolically healthy and fit. I have 21 month old twin boys. I'm turning 40 next year and I wanna live a long, happy, productive life. So the following markers are what I'm looking for in general. I wanna have low triglycerides, high HDL, and LDL particles that are large and buoyant. If this is the first time you've ever heard of large buoyant LDL, don't worry, we are going to talk about all of that. I want to avoid high blood sugar or insulin resistance at all costs. I want to keep my inflammation low and I do not want to have any vitamin deficiencies. I also want to have normal blood pressure levels and I want to minimize my visceral adiposity. Visceral adiposity is the fat that is inside of your body around your organs and you do not want very much of it. And I'm going to explain why I'm looking for these particular values throughout the video. Let's start with cholesterol because that is the one marker I get the most questions and comments about as I think everybody in the low carb community can attest. Let's start with the basic overview of cholesterol cholesterol. I'll try to make this quick, but bear with me because this is really important information that I think everybody needs to understand. My main reference for this next section is listed in the description below. It's an excellent video on cholesterol and its function by Dr. Laureen Lauer Smith. And the slides I'm going to be showing you to illustrate what I'm talking about come from this lecture. So cholesterol is a fat and it's necessary for life. It's vital for the structure and function of our cell membranes. It's vital for brain health. 25% of our cholesterol stores are contained within our central nervous systems. There's even certain brain cells that can manufacture their own cholesterol so they always have a constant supply. That's how important cholesterol is. Cholesterol is a precursor for vitamin D production and it's also involved in the production of many hormones including cortisol, estrogen, and testosterone. Cholesterol is also important in the creation of bile acids that aid digestion. Now cholesterol is a fat and fats are not water soluble. That just means that oil and water don't mix. So they have to be transported around the body with a lipoprotein. Lipoproteins are mostly made in the liver. Lipoproteins are like the vehicles and the cargo is the fat and the triglycerides. So let's look at a couple of these lipoproteins now. Let's start with LDL. Think of LDL like a FedEx delivery truck. LDL particles start out really large because they're full of cholesterol and triglycerides to supply the body the energy it needs. Once the LDL has delivered its cargo, it returns to the liver and it's now small enough to fit into a receptor on the surface of the liver. That receptor recognizes it, brings it back into the liver and recycles it. 
Now let's touch on another lipoprotein called HDL. The process is similar to the LDL process, just in reverse. HDL particles start out really small and their job is kind of like a garbage truck. So they go out and they collect up all of the unused fatty acids, triglycerides and cholesterol. And as they pick up that cargo, they get larger in size. Once the HDL particles have picked up all of their cargo, they return to the liver and now they are large enough to be recognized by a receptor on the surface of the liver. Receptor pulls them in and then the HDL and all of its cargo is recycled. Lipoproteins serve many other functions, including the transportation of fat soluble vitamins, such as vitamins A, D, E, and K, as well as transporting and delivering antioxidants. Lipoproteins also aid in immunity and cell repair. Now that was a very basic overview, but if you would like a more in-depth discussion of this topic, I have list a few really, really excellent videos in the description below under the heading Cholesterol 101. Now that you have a basic understanding of cholesterol and its function, let's dive into a few caveats before we get into my blood work. First off, your cholesterol numbers are not your sole indicators of metabolic health and they cannot be seen in a vacuum. You need to look at them relative to all of your other blood work. So you can't just cherry pick one number like a lot of conventional doctors do with LDL cholesterol and base an entire treatment plan around that one number. Second, cholesterol numbers are very dynamic. They can change quickly and they're heavily influenced by diet and caloric intake. They are also very influenced by fasting. This is kind of high level, but you nerds out there are going to enjoy it like I do. There's something called the Feldman protocol where you can eat very high fat and very high calorie for three days before a standard lipid panel and you can get your LDL cholesterol number to drop drastically. I will link a few videos in the description where Dave Feldman gets into this protocol because it gets a bit complicated, but it's really interesting. And all you really need to know is that food can change your cholesterol numbers very quickly. Third, from all of the low carb doctors that I could find, they couldn't care less about your LDL cholesterol as long as your other numbers are good. They're looking for low triglycerides and high HDL. Now, when you're following a high fat, low carb diet, especially one like carnivore, you may see your LDL cholesterol number rise. Dr. Ken Berry talks about how for about 30% of the population, they can see this occur. Now for a very small number of the population, they may see their LDL cholesterol numbers skyrocket and it's not due to a genetic disorder. These people are called lean mass hyper responders and they can see their LDL cholesterol numbers go to 300, 400, even 600. But these people also have very low triglycerides, very high HDL, and they are typically very athletic and lean. Many of these lean mass hyper responders have taken coronary calcium scans or CCTAs, both of which check for plaque in your arteries and they have none. Did you know that 75% of people that have a heart attack have low or normal LDL cholesterol? There's something else going on here. There's something else that we need to be more concerned about than our LDL cholesterol number. Fourth, did you know that the LDL cholesterol number in a standard lipid panel is calculated through something called the Friedwald equation? It's an estimate. Here is how it's calculated. You take your total cholesterol, you subtract your HDL cholesterol, and then you take your triglycerides, divide them by five and subtract that number. And that's how you get your LDL cholesterol. Now the Friedwald equation was often inaccurate. So testing companies have updated to a newer equation called the Martin Hopkins LDLC estimation. What's important to remember here is that your LDL cholesterol number in a standard lipid panel is an estimation, not an exact number. If you'd like to know what your exact LDL particle number is, and if those particles are mostly large and buoyant, which are desirable, or if they're mostly small and dense, which is not desirable, you'll need to get something called a lipid particle size test. What this test does is divides out all the lipoproteins on the basis of their density. You can have a low LDL cholesterol number, but if those cholesterol molecules are being carried around the body by small, dense, damaged LDL particles, you're gonna be in bad shape. It's been theorized that this is part of what's going on with those 75% of people that are having heart attacks, even though they have low or normal LDL cholesterol. So how do your LDL particles become damaged? Well, there's three ways. The first is glycation, which is high blood sugar or insulin resistance. The second is oxidation. Classic examples of oxidation include cigarette smoking and exposure to vegetable seed oils or ultra processed foods. The third way LDL particles can get damaged is through chronic inflammation. So the reason these small, dense, and damaged LDL particles are not good is because the particle is so damaged that the receptor that's supposed to let it back into the liver doesn't recognize it anymore. So it won't allow it to get back into the liver to be recycled. 
It's kind of like the FedEx delivery truck had a front end collision and now it can't get back into the garage. This means the damaged LDL particle remains outside of the liver and starts causing a ruckus. When the system is working properly, you don't have this buildup of these small, dense, damaged LDL particles. Now that you understand how lipoproteins function in the body, you can see that cholesterol in and of itself is not bad and that it's a really beautiful system when it's working properly. So the final thing to remember about cholesterol is this. High cholesterol alone does not cause heart disease. You need to have a combination of factors, including high inflammation, pathological trends in your lipid fractionations, insulin resistance, and visceral adiposity to cause heart disease. Type two diabetes puts you at greater risk of heart disease than just having high LDLC with no other risk factors. It's the insulin resistance paired with the chronic inflammation and the high blood pressure that causes damage to the arteries. While cholesterol does not cause heart disease, it does play a part once the damage is done. If you have high triglycerides, low HDL, and LDL particles that are small, dense, and damaged, this would be considered a pathological cholesterol level. Only the small, dense, damaged LDL particles are small enough to fit into those cracks in your arteries. Large, buoyant LDL do not fit. And here's the thing, if you don't have damage to your arteries in the first place, you are most likely not going to be experiencing any placking unless you have a very rare genetic abnormality. And this is something you can check very easily through a coronary calcium scan. I checked in my area and they cost $49. Now, if the damage has already occurred or you already have significant plaque buildup or you've already had a heart attack, this is not an automatic death sentence. You can reverse the damage and heal your body through food. Using food, you can lower your blood glucose, become insulin sensitive again, lower your inflammation, get your blood pressure back to normal levels, raise your HDL, lower your triglycerides, and change the composition of your LDL particles so that they are large and buoyant. And you can do this fairly quickly when you are using food, particularly a high fat, low carb diet. Now, conventional medicine has been very slow on the uptake with this, but I think as you continue to dive into this world, look at all of the data and the research, you're going to see that this is very intuitive. And I predict in the next five to 10 years, the focus is really gonna shift over to insulin resistance as opposed to LDL cholesterol. All right, we've made it through the weeds. I know that was a lot of information, but I think it's vitally important to at least have a basic understanding of how cholesterol works and get it out of your head that cholesterol is the devil. Again, if this is a topic that interests you, I have linked a ton of great resources in the description below that really get into the nitty gritty science of this. And I think they are all worth a watch. Before we move into my blood work, if you're enjoying this video, if you could give it a like, that lets the YouTube algorithm know that people are getting something out of it and it will push this video out to more people that could benefit from this information. If you'd like to support my work on a deeper level, I just launched a channel membership. For as low as $2.99 per month, you can support the testing and data gathering that I do. Click on the join button right down here underneath this video and that'll take you over to the membership page where you can see all of the benefits of becoming a channel member. And as always, be sure to hit that subscribe button for a free and easy way to support this channel. So let's jump into my blood work numbers, starting with cholesterol. I'm gonna first go through the standard lipid panel and then we will look at an advanced lipid panel so that we can look at my LDL particle sizes. So let's talk about my hypothesis. I came up with one before I got the blood work done. I hypothesized that my total cholesterol would go up, my triglycerides would either stay the same or go down, my HDL would either stay the same or go up, and that my LDL cholesterol would go up, but that it would be mostly composed of large, buoyant LDL particles. So for comparison, here's my standard lipid panel from before carnivore. This is from May, 2022. I was 210 pounds at this point, and I had been on the Noom diet for three months. And you can see from my numbers that everything looks good. A conventional doctor would look at these numbers and say, all right, that's good and not order any other tests. I did not have an advanced lipid panel at this time because I didn't know they existed and they are not a standard test. Now let's look at the results from my standard lipid panels that I have had over the past month and a half. Let's start with total cholesterol. The top number in all of these graphs will be my before carnivore baseline from May, 2022, so that you can compare. And you can see here that my total cholesterol has gone up and all of them started at 177 and then we have end of May 236 and then the latest was a 262. So it has gone up across the board. Now total cholesterol is a completely arbitrary number. It does not matter. When it's seen by itself, there's really no point to it. The American Heart Association removed total cholesterol from things that they're concerned about. And so I'm just gonna 
not worry about this number. Next, let's go into triglycerides. My triglycerides have been hovering around the same. They were very low to start in the baseline at 58. And then we've got a 66, we've seen a 52, so it went down at one point. And then my latest was a 65. So triglycerides staying in the 50s and 60s, you typically wanna aim for triglycerides under 100. I like to keep them under 70, so. I'm happy. Now my HDL has been steadily increasing. My baseline, it was at a 61, which is not bad. You typically wanna keep your HDL above 50. In my next test, it was a 65. And then the last two tests that I had, 79 for both of those. That is excellent. I am very, very happy with my HDL cholesterol. Now let's move into my LDL cholesterol. I know this is the one that tons of people are interested in. And my LDL cholesterol has gone up, though nowhere near the level of a lean mass hyperresponder. I started at 104. And we've got a 155, a 154, and my last one was a 173. So there we go. Let's move into the advanced lipid panel or the lipid particle size test. If you'd like to see more of these tests and their reports, I am doing an entire video on advanced lipid panels. So be sure to hit that subscribe button so you won't miss it. Remember that a lipid particle size test counts the number of particles and then it sorts them by size and density. So we're looking for an optimal A pattern. Let me show you the difference between A and B. So these first two slides are A patterns. Now, the optimal A pattern has a single large peak over the large buoyant LDL. This is what we want. Now the B pattern can look like this or like this. And this would be considered pathological because most of the particles are small and dense. I think this first one is less bad than the second one, but these would both be considered B pattern. For my advanced lipid panel, my hypothesis was that my LDL particles would be mostly large and buoyant, and that my small and medium LDL particles would be at a much lower percentage. I hypothesized that I would have the optimal A pattern, and I knew that it would be in the red because these reference ranges are not for people that are on a high fat, low carb diet. So my hypothesis was confirmed. In every lipid particle size test that I've taken, I have the optimal A pattern. I have mostly large, buoyant LDL particles. My small LDL particles are very low, so that's good. My LDL particle number is a little high, but that varies greatly. Higher LDL particle numbers have been seen on a high fat, low carb diet, so all in all, I am happy with these numbers. I'm still trying to find a lipid particle size test that will give me that printout of the optimal A pattern so that I can see the distribution. And I've taken four different versions of these tests. It has not been easy to find this information. If anyone out there knows how I can get a printout like this, please leave it in the comments below. So in summary for my cholesterol numbers, I'm gonna put them back up on the screen and we're gonna talk about all of these numbers holistically at the end. I've also included a graphic with some ratios that are important. This is total cholesterol over HDL, triglycerides over HDL, and then the very trendy one right now is ApoB to ApoA. And you can see that all of my ratios are good. Let's move into what I think are the most important blood work numbers, and those are blood sugar related. Now remember from the beginning that our goal was to have low triglycerides, high HDL, and LDL particles that were mostly large and buoyant. After that, I want to avoid high blood sugar or insulin resistance at all costs. So here's my fasting glucose from May, 2022. It was at 100. This is the only blood sugar related test that I had done at that time. So let's move into my more recent results. First, we've got my A1C. I have taken this test for Four times and every time I take it it's between 5.2 and 5.4. My fasting glucose has been going down steadily. The baseline was 100. The next two were 91 and my most recent that I took about a week ago was 80. My fasting insulin has also been steadily declining. I've taken this test three times. The first one it was 6.19. The second one was 5.5 and the third that I just took was 2.7. So this LPIR score it was part of one of the advanced lipid panels that I took. And all this is doing is measuring your insulin resistance. And you can see that I'm less than 25. I am very squarely in the insulin sensitive range. Let's talk about some continuous glucose monitoring. So I started wearing a continuous glucose monitor or a CGM in September of 2022. So I've got about three and a half months of data from before I started the carnivore diet. I use the NutriSense app. I'm not sponsored by them, but I'm gonna put a link to their website in the description because I absolutely love them. Let's compare a few markers now so you can see how much diet affected my blood glucose. We're going to look at five different blood glucose markers and I will pop up the before and after carnivore data side by side so you can see what I'm talking about. 
So first we have my glucose average. Before carnivore, my average was 90, and after carnivore, it was 73. Now 90 is not bad, but 73 is even better. Next is max glucose. This is exactly how it sounds. This is the max that your glucose hit in the measurement period. Before carnivore, it was 194, and after carnivore, 164, though this measurement is not accurate because I had had a high carb cheat meal on that day, so that was not related to the carnivore diet. Next, we have morning average. This is my blood glucose upon waking. Before carnivore, it was 91. After carnivore, it was 75. I was waking with much lower blood glucose. Next, let's look at sleep average. Before carnivore, it was 86. After carnivore, it was 70. Finishing up with glucose variability, which is very important, you wanna keep your variability at a 15 or less, 14 or less is ideal. And all this means is that you're not having drastic spikes and dips in your blood sugar. Before carnivore, that was 15. After carnivore, my variability was 10. So as you can see, all of my blood sugar related markers are really good. My blood sugar is low and stable. I don't have a lot of variability. I would like to get my A1C down a little bit, but really that's just me kind of being an overachiever. All of my blood sugar numbers are great. What these numbers show is that I am insulin sensitive and that I am at very low risk of developing prediabetes or full-blown type two diabetes. So let's move into some inflammation markers. I had five markers tested. We had HSCRP, C-peptide, uric acid, ferritin, and homocysteine. C-peptide can also be related to your blood sugar. Uric acid is a great indicator of kidney health. And ferritin can also, if your ferritin is good, your iron levels are most likely good as well. So as you can see, my HSCRP, 0 0.68, 0 0.7, very squarely below that 1.5 that we're looking for. My C-peptide came in at a 1.09, and we are looking for something that's less than 1.2, so we are good there. And my uric acid, my ferritin, and my homocysteine are all well within the reference ranges. Now it's no surprise that my inflammation is low. I was in good health when I got these tests done, so there's no acute illness that would have raised these numbers. I have very low and stable blood sugar, so there's no inflammation coming in from that end. My blood pressure is very good. Here are the last three blood pressure readings that I've had done at the doctor's office. These all happened in the last month. The carnivore diet is highly anti-inflammatory, so I expected all of these numbers to be well within range, and they were. Finally, let's talk about vitamins and minerals before we take a look at all of the blood work holistically. So I got a lot of things tested here. We had RBC magnesium, vitamin D, B12, folate, ferritin from earlier, and then we'll throw in some numbers from the basic metabolic panel. These include sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride. You can see here my RBC magnesium is a little high. Uh, that is actually okay. I had forgotten to not take my electrolytes that morning, so I think that skewed the numbers a bit. The reason that I picked the RBC magnesium and not the serum magnesium is because from all of my research, the RBC magnesium will show you more accurately if you have a deficiency, whereas the serum magnesium, you have to be like drastically deficient for any issues to start showing up in that test. So that's why I went with the RBC magnesium test. So before I started the carnivore diet, I thought that I would experience some vitamin deficiencies because I'm only consuming meat. I honestly didn't know if I could get all the vitamins and minerals I needed from this diet. Now, the only number that I would consider to be pathologically low on this list is my vitamin D number at 30. And even 30 is technically a normal number, but I'd really like to see those numbers higher. But also it is to be expected because most people are vitamin D deficient. Overall though, these numbers are great. I have based my supplementation on these numbers. I really don't take too many supplements. I'll link what I use in the description. I'm taking a D3, a K2, a biotin, and a fish oil. So you can see that my vitamin D supplementation has been working. At the end of May, I had a 30 and I just got another test done a week ago and I'm up to 56.3. In addition to supplementation, I've also been using an app called D-Minder that helps you track your vitamin D intake from the sun. So that paired with the supplementation has made a difference. I've gone up from a 30 to a 56.3. So now that we've gotten through all the numbers, let's talk about the blood work as a whole and talk about some interpretations. So here is what being metabolically healthy looks like. We talked about this in the beginning. Low triglycerides, high HDL, and LDL particles that are large and buoyant. No insulin resistance, low inflammation, and no vitamin deficiencies. We can also include normal blood pressure and low visceral adiposity in this mix. So what does it look like when you are metabolically unwell? 
Well, it's the exact opposite. You have high blood sugar or insulin resistance, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. In this case, it would be high triglycerides, low HDL, mostly have small, dense, damaged LDL particles, excess visceral fat, and chronic inflammation. So that's what we're trying to avoid. You know, but who cares what I have to say about this? It doesn't matter that I have deeply researched this topic. What do the doctors have to say about all of this? Let's start with conventional doctors because that's most doctors. My doctor, who has no idea about low carb, wanted to put me on a statin based on my LDL cholesterol number alone not even looking at any of my other markers, just the LDL cholesterol. Be aware if you are not going to a low carb friendly doctor that this will probably happen to you if you see your LDL cholesterol numbers raise when you're on a high fat, low carb diet. I will never take a statin, so I told her no. The side effects from statins are horrendous, including muscle damage, cognitive decline, drastic increases in type two diabetes, and so much more. I've linked a couple of research-based videos in the description if you would like to learn more about this. Honestly, in my opinion, I don't think statins are needed in most cases. The same effects can be achieved through changing your diet and you don't get the horrendous side effects. But you don't have to believe me. Please go and check out these resources. There's tons of information out there about how horrible statins are. I really just want you to make an informed decision before you get on a drug like this. Statins are way overprescribed. The medical industry and drug companies keep lowering the bar needed to be prescribed a statin. I think they've lowered it like six times. So now so many more people can be prescribed a statin. And why is that? Well, it's money. It's that sweet cash. Statins have made drug companies over a trillion dollars and counting. So please make an informed decision about this before you go on a statin. From all the low carb doctors that I could find, they all seem to settle on being more concerned about triglycerides, HDL, and blood sugar numbers. One doctor, the carb addiction doctor, I think it's Dr. Siwas. I'm gonna link a couple of his videos in the description below. He has a few reference ranges that he uses in his practice. I'm gonna put them up on the screen now. And again, this is not personal medical advice. This this is just the reference ranges that one particular low carb doctor uses in his practice. So what he's looking for when on a high fat, low carb diet is insulin between four and six, a C peptide below 1.2, a fasting glucose between 80 and 85, an A1C of 5.2 or less, triglycerides under 75, HDL over 75, and then the LDL range here, he has 120 to 300. Because as long as all of those other numbers are good, it doesn't really matter what your LDL cholesterol number is. So looking at all of my numbers, I am not worried in the least. Let's throw these numbers back up. I have very low triglycerides, very high HDL. My LDL particles are large and buoyant. I've got an optimal A pattern. I've got low inflammation. I'm insulin sensitive. My A1C is great. If we wanted to throw in a few more markers just for shits and giggles, my blood pressure is always really good. And my visceral adiposity, that is the fat that is around your organs inside of your body. You can check that through DEXA scans. I just had one done. And we can see here that my visceral fat is well within the healthy range. Every time I get a DEXA scan, that visceral fat goes down by a quarter pound. So all in all, I am very pleased with my blood work after six months on the carnivore diet. So let's talk about some plans moving forward. I plan on doing another full blood work panel at the one year mark. I'm currently three days into a B, 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 and E challenge. That is a beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. That's all I'm eating for 30 days. I got some blood work done at the very beginning, and I'm going to test my blood again at day 30. So be sure to stay tuned for that video. Like I said, I've been testing out a bunch of lipid particle size tests so that I can review them, show you where to get them, and show you the report that they give you. Channel members are going to have access to real-time data through community posts and maybe a couple of short videos. So head over to that channel membership portal to check that out. I have scheduled a coronary calcium scan around the nine month mark. I'm really interested to see if there's been any placking in my arteries. My hypothesis is that there will be no placking and that my calcium score is gonna be pretty close to zero, but this is gonna be really interesting to see. I'm going to share those results in my nine month carnivore diet update. So I'm a busy bee and I've got a ton of carnivore diet related content coming your way very soon. In the description, I have put a list of all of the blood tests that I've had done. I did get some of these done at my doctor through insurance, but most of them I found online and I paid for them myself. 
I'll put the cost of each test in the description as well so you can get an idea of price, and I am not sponsored by any of these blood testing websites. Like I've said throughout the video, I have extensive resources and references listed in the description. This includes videos, books, journal articles, regular articles, and case studies. I've put a link to my 200 day carnivore diet update right here. And over here, I'm going to link my carnivore diet playlist. Within that playlist, you're going to find my 30 and 90 day carnivore diet updates, along with my 69 pound post-pregnancy weight loss video, where I go into the differences between the Noom diet and the carnivore diet. I hope this video was helpful. And if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section below. I absolutely love hearing from you. And with that, I will see you in the next video.